All right, let's pick up where we left off last time in our web architecture overview talk. And here we'll talk about static, dynamic, and responsive web pages. So three different types of pages that we're going to look at just to kind of have a basic idea of what we'll encounter on the web will be static, dynamic, and responsive. So static pages are kind of the olden days of web programming back in the 1990s and early 2000s when we would see that the static pages often were just a bunch of text with some links and never really change. They're usually hard-coded and they're very easily created. Since they are hard-coded, you just basically type out all your HTML, put it out there, and it's good to go. However, because of that, they're expensive to maintain because anytime you have any changes, you have to go basically modify the code. Often because of that, they become out of date very easily because links get broken and they never get updated. Or they posted an article from 1995 and they never updated it until 2002. Dynamic web pages then are going to be a little bit more common at this point. The layout's not dynamic. It's going to be the same every time you go there, but the content's going to be dynamic. And the reason is because often those pages are using a database as its source to get certain information or RSS feeds from other web systems or news providers that would give you a list of different links with some basic text that you could read and look and go to. Images might be different. Social updates, of course, are going to be very dynamic. Now, dynamic web pages up front are more expensive to create because it takes a little time to program them to handle database connections and make sure that your page is going to respond correctly as everything changes. However, because of the fact that they're dynamic, the maintenance on the page itself is usually minimal. Once you get the page created, your database connection isn't going to change. Your layout's not going to change. The only thing that's going to change is the actual content, which is handled by something else putting that into the database. So they're usually up to date. And responsive web pages are much newer. These have come into existence because of the fact that we have devices now with different screen sizes. So a responsive web page means that no matter what device I'm viewing the page on, the size of the screen will respond appropriately. If I look at it on my phone, the columns will narrow down and become more vertical. If I look at it on an iPad or an Android tablet, it would be a little bit wider or might be even able to be widescreen format or if I look at it in the web browser, it would be the regular full-blown web browser look. They aren't often as fancy as a regular web page. The reason being because a regular web page might have a bunch of loaded images that are a certain size. And if I'm going to be responsive, some of my responsive web pages are going to automatically resize some images, but some things just aren't the same. So what you'll see is a more plain Jane type of look on a responsive web page, but because of the fact that they do work across devices, it actually ends up being great. Of course, you could have static or dynamic web pages that are responsive. It really doesn't matter. But most of your pages that we'll be creating will be dynamic. And there are some JavaScript libraries out there that allow us to easily integrate the handling of the resizing information, such as Foundation and Modernizer and things like that. So we may take a look at that as we go. So the next thing I wanted to take just a moment to talk about is GUI programming versus procedural programming. So if you've never programmed for a GUI, there are a few things that you need to keep in mind. With procedural programming, everything goes in order and nothing ever changes as far as the state is always the same when you hit a spot and then you can expect the user to do something and it will continue through that order in order as the states progress. With a GUI, however, you might be in any state and the user might press on any of your buttons. So you need to make sure that you're writing code that works together that allows us to keep from having issues if the state isn't exactly what we expected. Now we need to make sure that either we lock down controls or hide controls until we get to the point where we want to allow the user to do something. So there's just a little bit of different thinking that goes behind the GUI programming that you might see. So finally, I want to take a look at the Java HTTP servlet. Basically, the servlet is going to be our intermediary, which is going to allow us to interact between the client and the server. So it will take requests and it will handle responses. They're similar to applets, of course, but they're run by the server. Usually, your servlets are going to be extremely tightly focused in purpose. So you'll either create multiple servlets to do things, or you'll have one servlet to handle your database connection, and it will just interact with certain libraries. Now, all servlets have the same methods available to them because they all inherit from generic servlet, and then they're extended by HTTP servlet. You can go and look at that link there that's going to take you to the HTTP servlet, which will list all the methods. We're going to take a look at a couple of them here. All of our methods for our HTTP servlet are going to line up with the HTTP commands. So if there's a command like delete or get or post, which we'll look at in more detail as we grow here, as we learn more about this information, we will see that these commands will line up. The ones we're going to be looking at the most right away are going to be the do get and the do post. Those are going to be our request and our response methods that we're going to handle things. 
HTTP servlets have a service and they have an init method which starts them up and they have all the generic methods that they inherit from the generic servlet. The life cycle of a servlet is that the servlet is initialized when the application starts up or the first time it's called and you can configure that and we'll see that as we go. The servlet fires the init method when it first starts out and then it basically lives in the application container until we either remove it from the application container or the server restarts. Most of the time we'll, like I said, be hitting do post and do get to do our processing against the servlets. Just a couple things when we first get into servlets here in the next couple of lessons. Servlets can execute Java code, and so that will give us the ability to write out to the screen and do things directly by using Java print writers. The other thing that servlets can do, we can actually generate HTML and then print those out to the screen and actually print an entire HTML document from a servlet. So that wraps up everything that we've needed to talk about in our web architecture overview. We took a little time to look at the basic web architecture and some of the protocols and languages used. And we spent a little bit of time reviewing some HTML so that we have that as a base going forward. We looked at a few different types of web pages so we kind of understand where we've come from and where we're going to and the web pages that we'll see. We discussed programming for a GUI versus programming procedurally. And we took our first look at the Java HTTP servlet.